Well, good morning, everyone. In our study of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, we have come to chapters 4 and 5. In Romans 4, Paul asks his Jewish readers to look back to Abraham, the founding father of the Jewish faith. Why? Why is he suddenly talking about Abraham? Why is Abraham's experience and story relevant to Paul's argument that we discussed in chapter 3, that a person is justified by faith and not by works? First, let's take a step back. Just who was Abraham? His story is found in the book of Genesis, chapters 11 through 25. One of Noah's descendants, Abraham was first called Abram and is from the ancient city of Ur in what is now southern Iraq. Joshua tells us in Joshua 24 2, that Abraham's father was a pagan who worshiped other gods. Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshiped other gods. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, a deacon in the early church, neatly summarized the history of Israel for us from Abraham through to Solomon. Incidentally, Paul heard this sermon of Stephen's firsthand. Acts 7 tells us Paul was there when Stephen was subsequently stoned to death. Stephen summed it up this way in Acts chapter 7, starting in verse 2. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of his father, God sent him to this land where you now are living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even enough ground to set his foot on. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, God said, and afterward they will come out of that country and worship me in this place. Then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision, and Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him eight days late after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob became the father of the 12 patriarchs. Abraham was 75 years old when God first spoke to him. God made him a promise in Genesis chapter 12. I will make you into a great nation. God told him to leave home and go to the land I will show you. Abraham didn't even know where he was going, but he packed up his household and he went. When Abraham arrived in Canaan, God spoke to him again and told him that he would give him that land, give that land to his offspring. Abraham had no children. But God promised him that he would have so many offspring, they would be as innumerable as the stars in the night sky. Abraham believed the Lord, Genesis says, and it was credited to him as righteousness. After many years of waiting, Abraham and his wife Sarah finally had a son, Isaac. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Hebrews 11 tells us this about Abraham from verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Abraham's ultimate test came when God commanded him to sacrifice his son, his precious boy, the promised heir. Abraham got up the next morning and went to do it. At the last minute, God called out to Abraham to stop. He provided a ram and said, instead, Now I know that you fear God, God said, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Again from Hebrews 11, verse 17, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. 
he who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In Romans 4, Paul looks back to Abraham to provide both a definition and an example of the saving faith he has been discussing in chapter 3. Romans 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul then looks at the historical context in which Abraham believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul bases his applications not only on what God said about Abraham, but when he said it. So, when did he say it? Pick up your Bibles or pick up the pew Bible in front of you, and let's turn to Genesis, the first book in the Bible, chapter 12. In the first verses of Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abraham, still Abram at this point, and promises to make him into a great nation. So that's chapter 12. Turn to chapter 15. In verse 2, we find Abram asking how this is possible when he still does not have any children. God reaffirms his promise in verse 5 of that chapter. And then Genesis 15, 6 says, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now look ahead to chapter 17. Abraham is now 99 years old, verse 1 tells us. Over a decade has passed since Genesis 15. Here is where we read in verse 5 of God giving Abram a new name, Abraham, and the covenant of circumcision is given, verse 11. You will undergo circumcision and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Turn back with me now to Romans 4. In verses 9 and 10, Paul calls our attention to this order of events that we just looked at. We've been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. Abraham was uncircumcised when the promise was given. If circumcision is the sign of the covenant that identifies a man as a Jew, that means Abraham was still a Gentile. When he was considered righteous. The next point Paul makes is this, verse 13 of chapter 4. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. How did Paul know this? Let's check our history again. Abraham received the promise many years before the requirement of circumcision was given. And when did the Jews receive the law and the Ten Commandments? after the exodus from Egypt at Mount Sinai, hundreds of years after Abraham's death. So, Abraham was credited with righteousness before he was circumcised, and it was not through the law that Abraham received the promise. Great. So, why do I care? If Abraham was still a Gentile when the promise was given, then the opportunity to believe extends to everyone, not just the Jews. And if the promise comes through faith and not by the law, then the promise to Abraham's offspring is for his spiritual offspring, all those who follow his example of faith. Paul's reference then in Gen- to Genesis 15:6 becomes a proof that Christianity is not some kind of subset of ethnic Judaism as defined by works of the law because Abraham didn't come that way. All Abraham did was trust in God. Genesis does not say Abraham kept the works of the law and so God established a covenant with him. Abraham started where pagans and non-Jews start. That was where God met him. Gentiles come into the covenant. We come into the covenant by faith, exactly as Abraham did himself. Abraham was the beginning of this covenant family which Gentile believers have now been adopted into. In Romans 11, Paul uses the image of branches grafted into a cultivated tree. But what kind of family is it? Paul has redefined the family of Abraham in two ways, says theologian N.T. Wright. First, he has opened it up. 
so that it contains Gentiles as well as Jews, specifically Gentiles who believe in the gospel. Second, however, he has narrowed it down, so it no longer contains all Jews automatically. Jews are, of course, welcome, but the badge they too must now wear is that of Christian faith. God's covenant justice was always designed to put the whole world to rights. The answer to the question asked in verse 1, says N.T. Wright, is found in verse 16 and 17. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be grace, be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. God says to Abraham in Genesis 17, 5, I have made you the father of many nations. Paul takes this to mean that the ultimate family promised to Abraham was never meant to be from one nation, but drawn from all peoples. Abraham is the father of all who come to, faith, to God in faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. He is the father of us all. This was revolutionary when Paul wrote it. It should be wonderful and awesome to us today, too. It means that when we believe in God, when we believe that Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead, and when we trust ourselves to the God who has done this, we are assured that we are now part of God's family. Suzanne will talk about this more when we get to Romans 8, where Paul writes in, verse, in Romans 8, verse 17, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. It's pretty awesome. We're part of the family of God. Heirs, we are children, heirs with Christ. We'll talk about it more when we get to Romans 8. <laughs> Paul is doing something else here that we might not be able to see as 21st century Americans. He is providing a new definition for the word faith. First century Jews would have understood the word faith in Greek pistis more like we understand faithfulness. Faith for them was an action. It was faithfulness to God's covenant. It was keeping your end of the bargain under Mosaic law. Maybe something like what we mean by keeping the faith. Therefore, they might have misconstrued a justification by faith to refer to the Jews' own faithfulness in living up to the law's requirements by carefully spelling out that Abraham was credited with righteousness before he'd done anything, even get circumcised, Paul is clarifying for them what he means when he uses the word faith. As modern-day Americans, we tend to define faith as belief and thus make it intellectual. Do you believe in God is essentially, do you think God exists? Taken this way, faith would mean what we suppose, that we suppose something is true. According to Paul, both of these perceptions are flawed. Saving faith is something different. In returning to Abraham, Paul argues that the faith which is credited for righteousness is, in fact, simple trust. The heart's joyous response to God's word of promise, a conviction that although God offers the impossible, he will surely do what he has said. Faith is not concerned with acts or intellect. It is a word that describes our basic attitude towards God. As those who believe in the gospel, in God's good news about his son, we are assured that we are the people of the new covenant, the single worldwide family promised to Abraham. With Abraham as our example, I think we can ask ourselves, do we share Abraham's faith? Do we look in love, gratitude, and trust to the creator who promises impossible things and brings them to pass. Because God makes an incredible, impossible promise to us too in Christ. A promise of forgiveness and acceptance, a promise of life. Just like Abraham, we have to trust God against all odds. Humanly speaking, it is impossible for us to change our nature or our state as sinners, rightly subject to the wrath of God writes Lawrence Richards. But when we, like Abraham, hear the word of promise and trust the God who gave it, 
we too are credited with righteousness and given all that this entails. I personally find the stories of the patriarchs so encouraging. If you haven't read all of Genesis and Exodus, I challenge you to read it prayerfully. It's full of stories of great adventure and God's faithfulness shines through. Abraham was a great man of faith, was a man of great faith, who trusted God enough to leave home, not knowing where he was going, enough to live in tents in a foreign land because God promised to give that land to offspring he didn't even have yet, enough to prepare to kill his long-awaited son because God told him to. I left home and moved to a foreign country, but I knew where I was going. I had tickets. And I had people meeting me on the other end to show me the ropes. I'm amazed at Abraham's faith. But my favorite parts are the not so wonderful parts of Abraham's story. I am so grateful that the Bible does not hide from us the faults and failures of the heroes of our faith. Abraham screwed up like a lot, more than once. <laughs> Twice when sojourning in a foreign land, he misrepresented who Sarah was, passing her off as his sister, not his wife, because she was so beautiful, he was afraid they would kill him to take her for themselves. Twice. He wasn't smart enough to learn his lesson the first time. But perhaps his greatest personal failure occurred when he took his wife's servant, Hagar, in order that they might have a child by her. Why did Abraham falter? Because in, in times of crisis, he was afraid and he failed to trust God. Yet what does God call himself? God calls himself again and again in scripture. He calls himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The holy, awesome, perfect creator of the universe associates himself with these fearful, lying, conniving, sinful men. What kind of crazy grace is that? Abraham's fears and flaws did not disqualify him. God led him, tested, and transformed Abraham into the great father of our family of faith. Even though Abraham faltered, God remained faithful to his covenant and continued his work in and through Abraham. His story gives me the hope, the audacity, to believe that God can do impossible things in and through my life too. We should ask ourselves, at what points in my life are my convictions about God's power and faithfulness being put to the test? This is where to look for God's work in your life, stretching and refining your faith like he did with Abraham. It could be trusting that God's forgiveness for you is complete or believing that your individual acts of service are meaningful. Maybe you have to trust that God will watch over your loved ones. We can choose fear and anxiety in these moments or we can choose to trust the God of Abraham. Moving on to chapter five. Chapter five begins with the word, therefore. Maybe you were taught the same thing I was, that when you see therefore in the scripture, you have to ask what it's there for. Therefore in scripture means that you need to look back at the previous passage to see what point was made that is now being built upon. Therefore, Paul begins, since we have been justified through faith. That we have been justified by faith is the point Paul has been proving for at least the last two chapters. Paul now begins to tell us what being justified by faith means for us, how justification through faith affects our relationship with God. Therefore, he says in verse 1, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. So first, there is peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. There is no more hostility between us and God, no sin blocking our relationship with him. We no longer dread the outcome of judgment. Even more, we have gained access into the very presence of God himself. We have the right to approach, ushered into God's presence. The thought here is not about possible access to God, 
It's accomplished access to God. As a result of being justified by faith, we now stand surrounded by God's love. And as N.T. Wright put it, invited to breathe it in as our native air. When we stand in God's presence and begin to inhale his goodness, his wisdom, his power and joy, we sense that we are being invited to become what we were made to be. Because of Christ, we now hope for the time when we will share Christ's glory. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Paul then goes on to speak of suffering as something God uses to transform us into the people we were made to be. That progression leads from perseverance to character and from character to hope. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Suffering produces perseverance, the ability to face difficulties without giving in. The character quality of perseverance, though, is not an end in itself. It is one step in a process that eventually strengthens our hope. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs of all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. We rejoice in suffering not because we like pain or deny tragedy, but because we know God is using life's difficulties to build our character. I think when we come across these texts about suffering, sometimes our cultural ears might tend to hear something in the long, along the lines of, get over it, grin and bear it, look on the bright side. Of course, we do not want to wallow in our pain and never move forward, but I don't believe that God wants us to bottle up our pain either and pretend we're not suffering when we're experiencing difficult things in life. We know from studying the way that God made our brains that pretending away the hard times can damage us emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. God's word provides us with a pattern so we know where to go when struggles come. In Psalms and Lamentations, it is called lament. When we hide our pain, when we put on a happy face, we isolate ourselves. If we're unwilling to be open with one another, how will our sisters be able to share in our sorrows? If you're experiencing hard times today, you're not alone. I would imagine that every woman in this room has a personal story of pain, sorrow, difficulty, suffering. We can empathize with you, sit with you in your pain, pray with you. Please do not suffer alone. Last year, I helped my friend Sherilyn Orr work on a new book. Sherilyn is the developer of the Stoplight Approach. This is one of her books, a little advertisement, published by Focus on the Family. She has taken the brain science of emotional intelligence alongside the teaching of the Bible, because God made our brains, and simplified it into a, an approach that can be understood by any age and used by parents, schools, everyone really. Sherilyn was challenged by those she works with to create a guide for caregivers helping children through a time of loss. I worked with her on this book, and we spent time examining the biblical pro process of lament. In my research, I came across this book by Mark Vrogop, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. For anyone going through times of grief or suffering or helping someone through times of grief or suffering, I highly recommend this book. You can actually borrow any of these books from me today if you think they would be useful to you. Reading Vrogop's book, I quickly found parallels to the stoplight approach, and Sherilyn and I sketched out this diagram using stoplight language to illustrate how Vrogop says lament should work and where we get off track when we try to pretend away our grief. If you happen to know anything about early childhood development and attachment theory, this diagram will look really familiar to you. When our hearts are hurting, I don't know if you can read it very well, but the number one says a grieving heart. So when our hearts are hurting, where are we gonna go? Where do we go with our pain? Where do we go with our big, ugly feelings? 
Will we cry out to God? Number two, will we go to him with our feelings? Or will we give him the silent treatment? Hiding our pain cuts us off not only from one another, but also from our Heavenly Father who can bear all our burdens. We can choose instead to turn to God in prayer, to express our sorrow and disappointment, to voice our hard questions, number two. We can ask for his help, number three, because when we go to him, we're reminded of who he is, who he's promised to be. We can ask for his help and put our trust in his promises. And then for even in our sorrow, we can choose to trust that somehow God's plan is being worked out, even if we can't see it. Lament, we wrote in the book, uh, lament is an act of faith. Why would we bother to bring our pain to God if we didn't believe he was loving and powerful to help? We cry out to God because we have hope for something better. Hope in who God is and what he has done becomes an anchor for our souls. Our hope is built on Jesus' infinite love and grace, demonstrated in his life and death for us on the cross. In Christ, we have hope for eternal life. Faith and hope in Christ sustain us during our lamenting process. Paul says we should glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character. How can suffering produce anything in our lives if we pretend it isn't happening? If we don't actually go through it? We need to figure out a way that we can talk honestly about what we're going through so that we can go before God with it. We have something to do with it. This, this is part of our lives, but so we can be there for one another as well. We need to be able to work through it. Suffering is like the pressure put on carbon to produce a diamond. As we persevere, we are being formed and molded on the inside. God is producing his character within us. The end result of this chain reaction is hope. Confidence that God is in control and will see us through. Our faith provides a perspective that enables us to experience joy despite the pressures and disappointments. It's hard to sense God's love when we experience suffering. That's why Paul moves to Christ's death in the next verses. Jesus' sacrifice for us is history's great, decisive, totally certain demonstration of the depths of the love God has for us. This is probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ did not die to make us lovable. Christ died because God already loved us and wanted to be close to us. We are saved only because God took the initiative and demonstrated his incredible grace and love by sending his own son to take the punishment we deserved. God's love stands in stark contrast, Paul says, to even the deepest expression of human love, self-sacrifice, because he died for us when we were still his enemies, while we were rebellious and despicable. I want to encourage you to memorize this verse, Romans 5, 8, because when doubts creep in, when you feel alienated or lonely, when you feel unlovable, you can hold this fact, objective and unalterable. Christ died for you. The power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that saved us and is available to us today in our daily lives. In this first section of Romans 5, Paul lists several benefits that are ours through Jesus. If you glance through the first 11 verses, you can find them where Paul says, we have. It's important to note that Paul does not say, we will have, but we have. I've listed them on your sheet for you, and they're on the screen. Everything on this list is ours now to be claimed and enjoyed. We have peace with God. We have access to God and his grace. We have justification 
and we are saved. And we have now received reconciliation. Looking at this list, we realize that every benefit listed is spiritual, not material. Jesus did not die to make us wealthy, to guarantee physical health, or to remove all suffering from our earthly lives. Jesus died to give us gifts far richer than these. In Romans 5, 9 through 11, alongside the theme of justification, Paul introduces the theme of reconciliation. Because of Christ's death, we are not only justified, we are reconciled. Our proper relationship with God has been restored. Paul puts it this way in Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Theologian N.T. Wright says it this way, here at the center of it all is Paul talking about a reconciliation to end all reconciliations. Since we have been declared to be in the right, we have what? A warm glow in the heart? A sigh of relief that our sins have been forgiven? A new understanding of what it means to belong to God's people? Yes, all of those and more. But at the center of it all, we have peace with God. Having laid the foundation in chapters 1 through 4, Paul is beginning to build the structure a picture of Christian life in which all the ancient promises of God are coming true. And at the center of these promises is, is the establishment of a loving, welcoming, personal relationship between individual humans and the creator God himself. This may seem like nonsense to some people, that the God of the universe might actually be concerned with every single human, but, that, but what might be more absurd is to picture God as just like us, only a little bit bigger and all-knowing. The God of the Bible is so much more than that. He's the creator of the world, all-powerful, sovereign over all, and yet his very nature is love. So why wouldn't he, why couldn't he establish personal one-on-one -on -one relationships with every single one of us? Knowing all that God has accomplished should cause us to be filled with joy. We no longer need to be haunted by thoughts of judgment. We can boast in God, as Paul says in verse 11. Many translations use the word rejoice. We rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Paul has already told us that we should rejoice in the hope of the glory of God and in our sufferings. Now he exclaims that we should rejoice in God because Christ took our sins upon himself and paid the price for them with his own death. Amen.